up, everybody? Welcome to Draft Chat. This is episode number 139. My name is Zach. I'm one of your hosts. And joining me, as per usual, Ben Fisher. What's up, dude? Not too much. I'm wearing shorts in the middle of February. Take that for what you will, I guess. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and it's we're not in the southern hemisphere or near no. Anywhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to be clear, this is a bad thing. This is not normal. Um, it's pleasant. It's nice. It's a good experience. But uh, I don't know. C- can't help but think of the impending ecological crisis. Uh, I don't know. Just enjoy the shorts while we can. Yeah. Well, uh, today's our <laughs> one first impressions show. So we're going to talk all things one in just a moment. But before we do, of course, our usual housekeeping, check out the discord. If you're not already in that best place to be to chat with us, show off your trophies, which has been blowing up. I'm really happy we got this scoreboard thing. Situated oh, it's so good. Discord it's it's it, getting everybody involved in like actually being able to see how well everybody's doing is really fun. Um, we also have places over there that you can discuss picks, chat about life and any other nonsense you really want to want to chat about and uh, ben and i are sure to be posting some random stuff in there shortly because we'll be at mtg philly and if you want to find us at mtg philly if you're going to be there jump in the discord because that'll be the easiest way to sync up with us and figure out where we are the link to that is on our twitter page as well as in the episode description and if you'd like to support the show directly you can do so on patreon at patreon.com forward slash draft chaff pod huge huge thanks to all of our patrons who continue to support us each and every week we love you guys Perks over there include things like our Draft Doctor series, stickers, show notes, our pre-show recordings, and our Draft Draft Hero cards signed by us and sent to you. And again, you can check that out at patreon.com forward slash draft chaff pod. Okay, on to our crack draft type thing. What do we got, Ben? We've got a one pack one pick one. That makes sense, right? Ones. <laughs> so let's start off with our land. We've got the autonomous forge here, the uh, red tap sack land. I like these things. Um it's an aggressive format. I wouldn't put more than three of like a certain color in, but you could probably pretty safely play like two to three to maybe four of these if you're a slower deck. Yeah, the slower decks can can maybe get away with four. I don't really like playing more than two in the aggressive decks, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, any deck that can stabilize and have time to, to crack these is, is fine. Honestly, I think they work pretty well with cheap cards too, because sometimes on like turn five or six, you can crack them and then even play the spell that you draw that turn. Definitely not a first pick though. No, no, I'd take these somewhere like six. There's, eh, to be honest, lower than that because getting critical mass of, of low drops is so important. I take these probably closer to like eighth to 11th pick. Yeah, I often just wait until pack two to get them. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we've got Whisper of the Dross here. That's the one mana, minus one, minus one proliferate. Don't love playing black, but this is a good removal spell and you definitely want to kill things early. And this can deal with some pretty uh, pesky one and two drops, even a four drop or two. So... I don't know. It's it's uh, it's removal in a color that you don't really want to be in. It's pretty good. Not taking it. There's Volshock Splitter here. This is one of the few equipment that I don't love as much. It's just a four mana four two, and then you get to toss that two zero around. But it's it's equipped for a million, and I don't know. It's a four mana four two. Again, equipment is good in this format, but this is just the more expensive one. I would take the uh, the, the batter fist, the bar spiked batter fist over this bar. all the time. Yeah, bar batter fist. Same thing. It's a batter fist. Uh, I'm, I'm taking the doom fist or sorry, the uh, infinity gauntlet. Sorry, the uh, I don't know. The, any other famous gauntlets? What, what am I missing? The pip boy? Does that count? I don't think so. <laughs> so next up, we got Vraska's fall here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, this is, this is bad. <laughs> Yeah, just not where you want to be, even even though, like, even if this was a white card, you just wouldn't want it. I think this could be, I think this could probably cost one mana, and it might still be bad. Interesting. Okay. Hot take. I don't know. Maybe then, okay, then with multiples, it just gets kind of nuts. But uh, no, I think this is just not not very good, especially at three, you don't want it. Yeah, you could side it in if you know your opponent's got a Planeswalker and you don't have any other ways to deal with it, but. Yeah. Next up is Shildred's Head Cleaver. This is the four mana, two, four with Menace and Toxic, two. Hate to admit it, but this is a this is a, this is a beefer. You know, this thing can get in. I died to a, a black green deck, embarrassing as that is the other day. Uh, they had two copies of the Necrogen Rot Priest, the the one five uh, Vector Uncommon. They had a couple yeah. of this. I, you just can't. <laughs> like, what are you supposed to do? Anything with Toxic Two becomes awesome at that point. This thing in a dedicated Toxic deck is solid. In the corrupted decks, you'd rather have them get corrupted by your early drops, something like a crawling chorus to get an early and and get that online as fast as possible. But this is fine. You can play it. Yeah, I think there's some tension with this card because it looks like it should fit into a corrupted deck. And the problem is the corrupted decks, and we talked about this in the format breakdown, and I think a lot of other content creators did as well um, early on in the format, but the, the corrupted decks really don't care about getting any higher than three 
poison. Yeah. Like their sole purpose is to make all of their corrupted cards go online and then just smash face and kill your opponent really fast. And that can be black green and sometimes white green too. But there's also the builds of the, those decks that just care about killing with poison. But then you got like the incisor gladder builds that, that just want to kind of get corrupted and then swing for a million. Right. I will mention about this card, it does have Menace, and that makes it particularly effective with combat tricks. The two mana one in black, the uh, Death Touch and Indestructible, obviously a great combo with this. Yeah, it does make attacks really weird, though, because if your opponent has any number of, like, any number of power, really, like, this isn't going to trade for two creatures because it's only a 2-4, unless you have those combat tricks. So yeah. it does make it attack. It's not, it's not... It's not like a true menace creature in that you can like get profitable attacks when your opponent has multiple blockers. A lot of times you still just can't attack into a board with two blockers. Yeah, but here's the other thing about this. Oh, no, I should say this for later. But another thing about this format is if you're not doing specifically, I guess, the, the toxic kill, you don't really care about this. Because if you're just trying to get corrupted and most of your damage that's going to be dealt is normal combat damage, the, the, your opponents just won't care about this. I mean, right. if this was just a four mana, two, four menace, most people just wouldn't care if this attacks. You just, I mean, if you're trying to play aggro, you're happy to see this thing attack because it's a way better blocker at that point. Um, right. And then if you if you don't feel like you're being threatened by toxic damage, then who cares if you get two poison counters a turn? It has to connect five times to, to actually have an effect because um, two damage isn't going to really uh, slow down like a, an attacking deck that much. Um, I don't know. M- more on that later. Next up is the Phyrexian Atlas. Uh, all I'm going to say is if you want to tap out on turn three and do nothing... Be my guest. Go right ahead. <laughs> please. Please do. After that is Oil Gorger Troll. Ooh, man. Thrag Tusk? Siege Rhino? What, what are we going to call this? <laughs> I don't think it's quite Siege Rhino levels, but I, I'm cl- I'm comfortable putting it near the Thrag Tusk. This, is, this, is, this does a good Tusk impression. Yeah, this, uh, I mean, just drawing that card, gaining three life, nothing the aggressive decks want to see less in the mid to late game than this. And it's a 3-4, which Great is stable. a little understated, but... Four toughness is big in this format. I meant to mention this with the head cleaver too. Four toughness is kind of the magic number. Uh, there's a lot of like three fours running around and smaller like that two four and just random stuff like that. Uh, three four tends to be a pretty solid stat line. Uh, four fours are obviously a little better because they can attack through. But there's even some like there's the white two four that gets two uh, zero if you have two or more artifacts becoming a four four vigilance. Um, there's some other cards that are similar. There's the green uncommon that's a four four with uh, toxic three like three fours and four fours. I feel like are a pretty important stat line in this format. You know, a card can be a four three mandible just the car. And I've had this thing attack as a four three many times. That's the uh, two mana two one life linker. Whenever another artifact enters the battlefield under your control, it gets one one. This thing is great. I'm a big fan of this, uh, especially in like the red, white mirrors. Now you need ways to make mites. Uh, or you need to have like a huge number of equipment, which you don't tend to get. I found that most of my even red white equipment decks usually have like four or five of them. Uh, but this thing, if you have that many, I'd probably play a copy. If you have Charge of the Mites, you know. You, oh yeah, this card you loves get. Charge of the Mites. Yeah. And if you're in blue white, you just play a million of these. Next up is Ickerspit Basilisk. That was the three mana one three Death Touch Toxic one. It's fine. You know, it's whatever. I, I play it in my like white green decks and... It's probably pretty good in black green, but I don't think I've run up in that deck yet. Um, yeah, it's fine. You know, <laughs> you're not going to kill him with regular damage, but it's a good blocker and you can get in with toxic. So maybe better in like a corrupted vector or just a slow defensive vector. Next is Glistener Seer, the one mana O3 that enters with oil. You remove an oil counter and tap it to scry one. Turns out a one mana O3 is a nice body to have in this format. It's not great, though. You know, this doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> if you're yeah, like it's a, funny. Yeah. In pre-release, we we had this in my deck, uh, and a couple of them even, and loved it. Being able to scry yeah. every turn, because the decks that play this card can basically never run out of oil counters on it. Yeah, that's true. Um, and so being able to scry every turn is really, really good. That said, there becomes a point basically around like turn two or three, which isn't very late, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. where you'd rather not block with this because you want the scry engine. And so then it, it's like yeah. this weird sort of, Yes, it's an O3, but you're not actually blocking because you don't want it to die. And you know that like it's not going to trade with anything ever. So, you know, it's it's not unreasonable that somebody attacks into it having a, a trick up. Yeah, I mean, it's a great card from, you know, from the blue decks perspective, because a lot of the blue decks can't be super proactive. If you can if you can put a bunch of like one or two drops down as the blue deck and then kind of do the blue proliferate kind of shenanigans, spin your wheels later in the game 
put that off until later in the game after you already have a really stable board presence, then I think that's how those decks succeed when they can. Um, and Glistener Seer is a big part of that. So here's the thing. It's a solid common in the worst color in the set. Exactly. <laughs> by by a long shot. Uh, you couldn't pay me to take a Glistener Seer. I'm not going to cast one this format. Interesting. Uh, I hope you eat those words. But, <laughs> Watch, um, the next draft I open like Kaito and then get past the Jace or something like that. MTG, I'm like, MTG all right. Philly sealed, you're going to be playing mono blue. Oh um, my God, I hope not. But but you're right. I mean, in terms, definitely in terms of first pick, this is no like you're just not taking a blue card, basically, first pick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Unless maybe you open Jin Kataxis, but even then I'm not even sure I would take him over like a, a middling like green card. Um, definitely not taking Glistener Seer here. Like you said, it's a really good card in the worst color. So uh, our comments, not looking too hot. I'm leaning towards the Just the Car or maybe Whisper of the Dross, but I'm not happy about it. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I sort of eye up the or- the Oil Gorger Troll. Yeah, that's true. But I don't think it's a card I want to first pick, and I've seen them go around a little bit, so I'm not too worried about picking one up later in the f- in the in the draft. And like you said earlier, getting those early drops down is really really meaningful in this dra- in this draft environment. So I'd probably mm-hmm. take the Justiciar over the Whisper of the Dross. But yeah, still not super thrilled with it. I'm just not realizing there's an I in that word. I've been saying a Justice yeah. card this whole time. It's just this year. How about that? Everyone, uh, you can delete those angry comments you were typing out. Uh, you don't need to make them anymore. Where did I miss that? I just, I just can't read. I didn't go to school for English. So uh, anyway, uh, I think our uncommons can improve upon this. We've got Serum Core Chimera out first. I'm not going to read all that. You know, you know that that meme? Yeah, it does, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, does all the, it does all the oil things. It proliferates a bunch. You get the picture. Probably yeah, uh, a reason to play blue, hmm. but I still don't want to play blue. <laughs> yeah, happy for you and or uh, sad. Uh, I'm not reading yeah. all that, though. I, I'm not playing this card either. It, it is good. I did have an opponent that had three of these. Uh, it was okay, disgusting. Yeah. Um, and that, that, I mean, that's a reasonable thing, right? If you are in an underdrafted vector... And you just pick up every good piece you can get. And like people are passing you like blue rares and like strong uncommons. Your deck's going to be good. And right. that's an interesting textual element of formats like this where certain colors are like so overbalanced. Uh, I think the draft experience, it sways back and forth. I've had some really cool and fun drafts and then some that are a little on rails. But every once in a while, you'll get just like a, it'll be very, very obvious that a certain lane is open. Just jump into it and you might get paid off. That being said, definitely not starting with this. Yeah, these are the kinds. So, and this is something I want to talk to you in particular, Ben, about as we get on in the rest of this episode. So I'll, I'll table this for a minute, but there, you brought up a point there that I think is worth diving into. Definitely trying not to first pick this card. I could see taking it relatively early. If you just are trying to go all in on getting the best blue red deck, cause you expect nobody's going to draft it. But, mm. uh, we typically don't advise you to take multicolor cards in pack one anyway, pack one, pick one anyway, and taking a gold card that's dipping into the worst color in the format, also probably not advisable. Now, here's a card that I am happy to first pick. Evolving Adaptive. Windmill Slam. Love it. <laughs> yep. Yep. One green uh, just comes in as a 1-1. One, one, then anytime anything with greater power or toughness enters, and I didn't realize it was toughness until I saw it in play, uh, it gets an oil counter. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had your opponent do the thing where they attack with this into your, like, three three and it's a one one and you go oh hmm no big deal right and then uh they like flash in something and then they cast free from flesh to put two more oil counters on it and give it plus two plus two and then you go oh like i would need to the four four or i would need to the five five to trade with this you know <laughs> like, to trade with it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah uh awesome really really good particularly in red green a little worse in green white where you care more about uh poison and toxic than than anything else but you would still be very happy to play this in green white i mean it's a it's a one drop that often grows into a four or five drop and can get way bigger if you have any kind of proliferate payoffs just really strong yeah and the interesting thing is in a lot of sets that have cards that are this powerful with even the one of the main set mechanics uh you would see the main set mechanic kind of not touch this color as much but green is also a very heavy proliferate color so you Mm -hmm. can get the proliferate triggers if you want them from various cards in green without having to touch blue and that's another notch in this card's favor. So here at Draft Chaff, you know, we're a little bit spiky, but I think we do err more on the side of, of Timmy's. You know, we, we love some good nonsense, some, some good fun. That's why we do this, right? Uh, Churning Reservoir is the fun pick here. <laughs> Evolving right. Adaptive is the, it's, you're at the GP, you're sitting down, you're opening your packs. 
uh, you take evolving adaptive. But if you're having fun, you got to try this reservoir out. It, it is really fun in the right decks. If you have a nice oily deck, if you're all oiled up and, and you want some oil, uh, this thing will give you as much oil as you could ever want. This thing is just, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking like, I'm thinking mid-grade pizza topping restaurant levels of oil. Like it is soaking wet to the point where you, you're thinking about like getting a napkin or something to dab some of it up. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, that was, uh, okay. Yeah. It, uh, interesting analogy. Um, <laughs> I, now I will say this is not a card that I typically find myself wanting to first pick. It is really fun, but it is heavy build around territory. Yeah. So yeah. you, you definitely need to get a deck that's going in the right direction to support this card. When you do, it feels awesome and it's a fun card and it does the thing. And it actually, you could kind of almost ignore the second half of this and it would still be an awesome card. Uh, mm-hmm. just, in the right deck just putting oil counters on random stuff that said like i i don't really want to first pick it because it is super heavy build around and typically if you're going to draft that deck it's going to get passed to you later on anyway yeah that's true this pairs really well with the lower drop cards that you basically never expect to die that can put oil counters on themselves or enter with them on themselves particularly things like axiom engraver this is an awesome synergy with um the uh, the, the one drop green thing what is it root vine cultivator i think the cultivator, Rust. Rust Vine Cultivator. Yeah. Uh, great with that. Anything that in the late game can just take an oil counter off of itself, because then this is just a one mana artifact that says pay two tap, make a one one. That's really yep. good in a board stall or like a uh, even just a top deck board. Like you're very happy to have that. Yeah, especially in these red decks where a lot of times getting even just a like if you can just accumulate a bunch of one ones and then top deck a hazardous blast, you can just win the game on the spot. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Now, our last card out, our rare here, is the Seed Core. So, this one, this one's silly. You can tap it for colorless. Oh, it's a rare. It's a sphere, for those wondering. Uh, you can tap for colorless. You can add one mana of any color to cast Phyrexian spells or activate Phyrexian abilities, which, to be fair, is pretty much everything in the set. There's, like, a few red and white cards, and I guess the equipment aren't, but creature-wise, that's pretty much all of them. Uh, and then the fun part, if your opponent is corrupted, you can tap it to give target one, one creature plus two plus one until end of turn. Now I've had the opportunity to take this. I haven't, I've taken things like good removal spells or good creatures over it. Have you seen this card in play at all or no? I've never seen it played. I don't even think I want to play it. It's just, I mean, okay. The, the tap add mana of any color for Phyrexian creature spells hits like 95% of the creatures in the set. So that's yeah. almost not really a, a, a pro it's not a problem r- really in this set. The corrupted thing is an interesting payoff, but like you give one creature plus two plus one until end of turn and you got to set up corrupted first. Like this seems like a fine land. I, I definitely wouldn't not put it in my decks if I had mm-hmm. one, but I'd much rather just have a card that does something, you know, like maybe evolving adaptive. Yeah. Like I think I'd even just take like the just this year over this. Yeah, yeah, honestly, I would too. Uh, I, this is a pack that I cracked on Arena, and I took the Adaptive out of this pack, which I, I think is the correct pick. Adaptive just says, put me in a green deck, you know, and, and then I'll become a 10-10 or something like that. Um, yeah, it just demands an answer. Whereas the Seed Core, yeah, I mean, you probably take this like 10th pick when you go like, oh, like, I guess that kind of does go in my deck, and it does tap for all my stuff. And if your deck is mostly Phyrexian creatures, then it is kind of just good fixing. Um, I don't know, always taking the Adaptive after this. If the adaptive weren't in the pack, probably taking the just this year. Yeah. Yeah, which says a lot about the format, I think. All right, on to our Teferi Tibble. This is our Roses and Thorns style segment where Ben and I share a high and a low from the past week. So, Ben, why don't you kick us off? So, uh, my Teferi this week, we've got Magicon Philly this weekend. That's in yeah, three days for us as of recording. That's tomorrow as of release date for listening. Or maybe even we're there right now. If you're listening sometime during... Saturday, 12 p.m. to 5 or 6 p.m. EST. We are there right now. Uh, I already scooped up my, my last game. I went 03 and dropped at the uh, at the, the sealed thing. So, yeah, anyway, <laughs> just speaking be to the future. Because because you you have a, a relatively decent track record of like projecting you know, <laughs> your your um, eventual success or failure onto whatever event is coming up. Yeah, that's true. Then again, if I did well in the event, they would have all heard it on Discord by now. So I guess we'll oh, see. That's true. I mean, we're going to be like live tweeting the whole thing anyway. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm excited for that. It's it's probably the biggest tournament I've ever played in, like people wise. I mean, it's been ages since a GP, but this is a PTQ. This is a this is huge, right? 
Um, so that that's gonna be sick. Looking forward to seeing people there. Uh, obviously, getting to go to a tournament together is always fun. Like we'll be the draft chef guys walking around. Like <laughs> that's cool. Um, just just on its own. And uh, I like the format. I, I'm enjoying it. I think more than most people. Uh, I think I can enjoy any format where you can find how to win. <laughs> you know, which I get isn't isn't there for everyone. Sometimes um, you know you actually want to have more fun with it. But I guess it depends on how you get your fun, right? Where it derives from. Uh, Tibble for this week. So I was refilling my soap in my bathroom earlier today, and uh, it's nothing stupid. It didn't explode or anything. But I, I refill the soap and I I like go to wash my hands with it. And it just kind of like splurts out. I had like a, a foam soap and I go, that's weird. Maybe I overfilled it. So I'm like, all right, well, what I, this happens sometimes. I just got to like use up a bunch of it and then it'll go back down to normal levels. So the air in- intake can uh, like get opened up and then it can start like foaming up the soap like normal. So I use up a bit, use up a good amount of the soap, still uh, nothing. And then I think to myself, wait a minute, did I use the wrong one? So I go to my closet. And I find that there are two identical soap refill things, one of which I did not remember buying the like normal non foaming hand soap. They are perfectly identical in every single shape, way, color, even like the, the graphic design is like identical, except for one little tiny thing that on one of them says foaming and the other does not. So anyway, now at this point, I can't put it back. It's going to be a mess. So I'm just resigned to using up this non foaming soap in my foaming hand soap dispenser and every time it makes this disgusting like splurting noise and i'm like man <laughs> <laughs> anyway this is a uh, this is this is a uh, my, my problem for the week the usual things apply i'm exhausted school is hard uh students to stay after for like two hours every day for extra help which i'm happy to give but means less time for exercising drafting cooking i've had to make concessions and all that stuff this year and uh, that's not fun. Anywho, what's up with you? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo the MTG Philly stuff for my Teferi. Very excited about it. Uh, it's the first. Yeah, I mean, it's the first big event Ben and I have been to since um, the last GP, which was in our area, which was Theros Beyond Death. So it's been a couple of years even. Well, we and, went to SGCon. Uh, that counts. Well, you went to SGCon. We didn't go to we didn't both go to that. I say we as a show. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. The show no, the, the, nice. it'll, it'll be great. Um, and it, because this is a, like a PTQ, like you said, um, it's getting a lot of attention. Tons of, uh, you know, well-known faces and names in the MTG, you know, Twitter sphere and, and otherwise MTG universe here is they're going to be there. So it'll be great to kind of run into some people that we either haven't talked to in a while or would love to meet but haven't gotten the opportunity to. Um that's going to be really cool. My tip is that I've been really busy lately and I've had this weird form of being busy where like I have a ton going on and simultaneously feel like I have nothing going on. It's like really strange. I don't really know how hmm. to process that mentally. Like I have tons of stuff taking up my time, but then I'm like, did I actually even do anything? I'm, I'm not hmm. sure. Weird. All right. With that on to our listener question of the week. And this week, our question comes from Rotafia in the discord. Rotafia asks, what events will you guys be doing at MTG Philly? Who? Well, the big one. We are doing the Saturday noon four slot, which means four people will functionally win uh, pro tour qualifier. Top four, send them straight to pro tour number two, which pro tour number one is actually also happening this weekend at this convention center, which is super sick. Uh, honestly, it kind of bummed that I'm not gonna be able to watch like the stream like I usually do. It might be hard to to keep track of that as well as competing the actual event. But this is a projected to be like eight or nine hour PTQ, right? And there could be a few hundred people that enter. It could be maybe a thousand even. Uh, prizes extend out to I think 140th, 138th ish place, uh, and the prize support is obviously very good. Um, super excited! It's a huge tournament. I mean, it's going to take many, many rounds and it's going to be a lot of stuff. There's a cut to top eight, which, you know, realistically, we're going to see if we make that. But uh, we're carpooling. So hopefully either both of us make it or none of us make it. Yeah, that'll be awkward. Um, So, yeah, we're definitely planning to do the main event there. It is one sealed. So we are kind of at the mercy of the pack gods. We'll see what we open. Uh, We may have wasted all of our sealed luck in pre-release, which would suck. But yeah, uh, probably a very fun experience. So. Um, if we do just like bomb out of the main event, probably, I mean, we, we do tend to try to find two headed giant events. We may just hit up some really cool drafts. They've got some mystery booster stuff going on. Uh, we'll probably try to find folks and play some commander, you know, all the regular stuff. I don't know that we'll do any like other specific events besides maybe getting into a draft or two and, uh, giving two headed giant a go. 
Um, hopefully we'll only be doing the one event and we'll just make it to, to top four and we'll get a PT invite and uh, that would be great. Uh, we I can see what you did there. Brand brag about doing making a <laughs> high, high placing in, in big events. Yeah, I'm still thinking about how you said the one event, you know. Uh, Could you say the one one event? Nope. I'd like to say that I won the one one event. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh yeah. Um yeah, so all right, on to our main topic then. We've kind of been already touching on our main topic, which is our first impressions show. This is kind of our opportunity to go over some of our favorite and least favorite things about the new format. Um we started doing this now after the live draft. So if you haven't checked out the live draft, which is our very first draft of the format Ben and I do together, check that out. That was last week's episode. Um but let's just dive into it. We've gotten a little bit into our thoughts. Ben, what are what are some of the first things that come to mind when you're thinking about one now that we're like two weeks into it? So I feel like first we should probably address the live draft in which we floundered between red, white and a middling red, green deck. Turns out Look, red, I'll green. Take, I'll take the I'll take the, <laughs> the L on that one. Um, we got handed a super sick red, white deck that I pushed Ben off. Passing <laughs> Jorah Kadeen, <laughs> passing Kemba. Passing, I, th- I think we passed War one of the whip. uncommon ones, the War Whip too. I don't know. I'm not gonna say that we would have trophied pretty easily with the red white deck, but uh, you I'm not gonna not say that. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my trophies have been red white at this point. So, uh, anywho, it was painful, but I did finish three and three. I could clearly tell that red green had some power behind it, but our build felt a little slow compared to some of them, and it wasn't deep enough into oil as I think it should have been. Uh, but anyway, that's all in hindsight. I've been having a lot of fun with this format uh, because one particular reason, uh, blue sucks and Naya is great. And historically in formats where blue sucks and Naya is great, I'm a pretty happy camper. Yeah, I mean, I'm not happy that blue sucks, I guess. Uh, it is good to see red green actually have like a really solid deck, though. I feel like we haven't seen yeah. red green have a thing in a while. And this this time it's thing is not just necessarily be big and beefy like it's got a little bit more going on, the nuance with the oil counters. It kind of all mm-hmm. does amount to being big and, beef, big and beefy, but um, it's a little more creative this time around. And it, it works, which I think is great, especially in a set that's super aggressive because the red-green decks are still kind of aggressive, but they have op- they have like the opportunity to kind of take over the mid and late game as well. And, yeah, uh, yeah. That's really fun. They can go just a little more mid-ragey than some of the super low-to-the-ground decks, which can help them win in like longer games and things that stall out. I mean, it's, it's limited, and this is a set without a ton of inherent card advantage. There's no inherent card advantage mechanic in the set like Lesson Learn or, or Cycling or things like that. So you can get into that top deck war where you've played out your whole hand, you're kind of at parity, and you're going, all right, how do I get ahead of my opponent here? And then when your opponent is playing red-green and they play an Incubation Sack or an axiom engraver and then all of a sudden they have this ability to start gaining additional value in those middle turns then you're like oh man i need to draw something now or i'm just going to lose if this game keeps going so i think we should also shout out red white for actually being pretty successful in this format for being the equipment vector how many times have they tried to make red white equipment good like i I don't even know like 10 (laughs) well how many have they tried to make it good i don't know that anybody but the developers could tell us that they've put it in sets quite a lot and it's (laughs) never good (laughs) yeah we've seen it a bunch right and it, it rarely comes together but it did here and and i think a big part of that is making it so that your creatures have living weapons slash vermeer and slash whatever you want to call it but uh having those equipment creatures is definitely a big aspect of it equipment that just kind of come free attached to existing creatures that you're honestly pretty happy to put in your deck anyway just like a red three one a two matter three one is just what you'd want in this format regardless yeah especially i mean we we saw the ones like in um in the more recent zendikar zendikar rising or whatever that that set was called Mm -hmm. where you you didn't get a creature when you played the card but it it would etb and you could attach it for free to a creature as it etb'd yeah and those were really good and we thought that was a great approach to that that whole sort of equipment fiasco where you're you're not really getting any value out of the card until you can equip it the first time this is just so much better because coming in attached to a creature means that they actually do something when you have nothing on board and that makes a huge difference in sets where like when you're comparing whether equipment's going to be good or not yeah i I love equipment i always have loved equipment i've always known that it's bad you know in modern limited sets just aren't really designed for you to pay three mana to not affect the board and most equipment will do that i mean look at the one there's the uh the 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 might maker right the the one of the white and it it makes it so that when a creature attacks it makes a might and it equips for three you just can't play that in this set but other two mana equipment like the um 
the batter fist are fantastic. I think a big part of that is that it comes with the body on board. So you're still actually affecting the board when you play this. And really, there's only so many slots in a deck, in a limited deck that you can afford for equipment, right? Because then if you're playing like red, white, this is an aggressive vector. Usually an aggressive color pair tends to have aggressive vectors in it rather. And then you also want things like combat tricks and like cheap removal spells to pair well with your aggressive creatures. And then when you start to jam some equipment in there too, then you start to get to a weird creature ratio, or maybe you're not playing as many pump spells as you should be for beating down. Uh, But this is, this is, I think the perfect way to do it. Yeah. When your equipment are creature spells, but then also aren't creature spells. So like the stuff that cares about non-creatures, yeah, not, yeah. not creature spells hitting the board get way better and can kind of navigate those vectors as well. I think that that's really huge. So totally taking the L. Nia is great. We should have played red white equipment in that, in that <laughs> draft. I get it. Uh, I'm not happy to be wrong there, but I am kind of happy that a red white equipment deck is actually decent. Um, one other thing that I've noticed this, this format, Thrun is definitely not as unmanageable as I thought it was going to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the format is still very bomb heavy. Mm -hmm. The bombs matter so much in this format. And you can be basically like at parity or even ahead on board and your opponent plays one bomb and you're just like, well, I lose the game. So I've been keeping track. I've opened Mirren's safe house five times. Uh, That is the rare and uh, it it, it does nothing at all. (laughs) You you can turn it into a, a sack land, a sphere if you want, and then sack it for like, what, five mana total, I guess. Five, five mana draw a card um that hurts when you get to your pack and you open it and your rare is a dud it's especially painful but i think we've seen several decks capitalize on that ones with card selection ones with card rummaging effects particularly axiom engraver which is one of the highest performing commons in the set counterintuitively right i mean it's a, it's a one three in red like what, what's going on there it just so happens that I, I think a part of this might be these decks want to get to their bombs these decks want to go find their, their I don't know, their Bladehold War Whip or their uh, big green, uh, like 5-5 five five or something, or uh, their Cinder Slash Ravager, things like that. And the ability to dig for those with what's honestly infinite oil counters, if you want them, uh, th- that's huge compared to an opponent who's just top decking lands every turn. Yeah, actually, a lot of my game losses in in my more recent drafts, uh, I played, played one basically mono blue deck that I was kind of splashing black in Hmm. and um i had three experimental auguries which you would think is great card selection you'd think that actually does a lot there were so many games where i was sitting there top decking land after land after land after land and just dying because i Mm -hmm. can't do anything with those cards and that's not something you typically think of in blue because blue tends to be the card draw card selection kind of color and it just yeah there there's a lot better things to do in other colors right now it's it's very yeah yeah I think it's like when the best card you can select in blue is worse than what your opponent is doing with the red green commons, then maybe blue doesn't get to make advantage of it quite as well as like the red and green decks do. Yeah, that's true. Um, one thing I've noticed, I, I would, and it kind of to that point, uh, I was thinking if I had to describe the format in a single word, I would say unforgiving probably. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Whether it's in the early game or, and you're playing like you go one drop, two drop, three drop, and your opponent's like, "Oh, I, I'm dead." <laughs> or if uh, you you drop like a five or six mana bomb, I would call the rares high impact, right? And that's part of that yeah. unforgiving nature. If you are playing a little too scared, right? If you don't commit to the big attack to try to push that damage, their, your opponent could top take their bomb, they could cast it, and they could come back from nowhere. I've seen a Traxa resolved in this format, right? Like I, yeah. I, I've resolved seven. I, I, I curved the uh, the red blue six six flyer uh, into the Zol- Zolprindel, the, the green Dominus. Like you can cast these high impact late game cards; they just take over, and then your opponent goes, "All right, well, I can't win." But sometimes your opponent also goes, "Oh, I can't win because of your one drop, two drop, three drop curve." Yeah, exactly. This is, and we we jokingly say this in a lot of sets, like, oh, if you don't do something by turn two or three, like you lose a game. If you don't do something, if you don't affect the board, I'll say by turn two, scoop them up. Like, just move on to your next one. <laughs> and and yeah, and honestly, I'm only kind of exaggerating there. Like, there are so many games where not impacting the board on turn two literally just means you lose the game. That said, I'm still kind of ironing out the the draft experience. And one thing in particular that I'm trying to sort of figure out, and this is something I alluded to during our crack draft that uh, Ben, I'm very curious to pick your brain about is how heavily to prioritize the any Naya cards, let's say like a decent uncommon or common over bombs that are in other colors. 
So say you open, you know, your pack one pick one, you happen to open like a really good blue rare and you've got, I don't know, let's say like maybe the war whip, um, or Mm -hmm. even just like a Basilica shepherd, like where, where do you go? What is your brain telling you? Like pack one, pick one. How are you uh, prioritizing those Naya cards over or under, um, bombs and other colors? So let's, for the sake of argument, imagine that it's something like a Jace or a Blue Sun's Twilight, right? Just really good game ending blue rares. I still take it. Uh, I do then hope to pair blue with something that I know to be underdrafted or undervalued. Um, and, and this is, you know, super contextual, right? This is what draft is. The people in your draft to determine what you're going to get, right? If they are all thinking the format is balanced, I can play a blue deck, then maybe you just get cut from it, right? Like th- this stuff can still happen. Uh, maybe they also opened the Jace, right? But then I am looking, uh, and I'm also thinking about some some data that I've seen, thanks to Sirkovitz, who, who put out this great uh, thread about how uh, red is still a little bit underdrafted, despite being overperforming, uh, whereas some of the other ones are um, a, a little uh, improperly valued, right? Where, where white, I think, is a little overdrafted, and I think he mentioned that that green is about where it should be and that black is a little overdrafted, but it's actually worse than people think it is. Uh, white is like overdrafted, but it's actually about as good as people think it is. Uh, we can link the entire thread. I'm probably butchering it, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a fantastic read if you want to try to get a handle on the draft in this format. That being said, I am heavily prioritizing towards the uh, Naya colors. Um, this is my personal preference anyway. Honestly, in other draft formats, if you did like a long-term analysis of my draft picks, you'd probably find that I do tend to overvalue cards that are uh, white particularly, and then red and green. But I think that we can still draft all colors. This is this weird thing about this format. Right now, it's still in, in limbo, right? This is like when we had uh, blue-black was super, super overdrafted in Midnight Hunt, right? Because blue-black was the most busted color combo. Everyone knew it. Everyone knew that those decks were fantastic in Midnight Hunt. So I took it upon myself to go super deep on mono-white. And I would get these awesome white decks because everyone was just passing me these white cards. And I had to go pretty deep on it to figure out how to best make those decks tick. I did figure it out. Red, white was great. Uh, and I would still gladly draft like a good white or a white black or, or um, white red deck in, in Midnight Hunt over like a blue black sometimes. I think we're going to see something similar happen here. I lost to a mono blue deck yesterday. It was embarrassing, <laughs> but they just did a bunch of commons and uncommons and just solid flyers. And they just chipped in and they counted some of my stuff. And I was playing a good green white deck and I was a little tilted. I was like, man, I thought my deck was supposed to be better than this. <laughs> and their deck should have been worse than this. But um, they, they, were, they were, had a very solid uh, artifact vector within their deck and they made good use of it. Yeah, I will say uh, just for posterity's sake that that blue deck that I was like, kind of splashing black for it did end up going five three so it, did, it wasn't like a total just like mm-hmm. crap deck it did it did work but um okay so so i guess what i'm what i'm curious just to to pin all that down right um are you when you take a, a let's just stick with blue for for example if you take a blue rare like a jace or a blue sun's uh blue sun's twilight uh pack one pick one are you like taking that and then thinking well i'm not drafting blue We'll see what gets passed to me but i'm not like i'm not married to blue i'm just taking a card that i'm hoping to splash later on if if the draft supports it, you're not really thinking, okay, I'm drafting blue now. Yeah. I actually did splash blue sun Zenith in a red green deck. <laughs> uh, Twilight, whatever it is. Uh, it was awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm taking it with the idea of the expected value of the card, right? I'm thinking when I take this card, I'm adding some amount of value to my pool and sure, maybe I just get past an evolving, uh, adaptive, right. And I just, I just start going into green and I just like forget about the blue thing. Sometimes that just happens, right? Sometimes it's just correct to pivot off your first pick. I think people are married to their first pick way too often, but I am then at that point considering the value of future blue cards and I got to keep in my head. Well, they're not all that great, right? I- I'm likely not to add as much value from my blue picks this draft as I would from if I had taken like let's say the green rare was in the pack or instead or like a white rare like Skrelv's Hive or something then I'm thinking oh boy if I can get into white then I have a lot of like expected value from these picks but if I do take a blue rare first I'm maybe a little more likely to try to pivot off of it maybe a little more open to other signals um, but still very open to playing good blue cards that they come my way especially ones that are on vector so something I noticed about this format is that The draft is on vector rails a lot of the times. Um, For example, let's say it's pack two. In pack one, you kind of went into green-white, right? 
you know, I don't know, you took like rares, you got a bunch of good green-white stuff, removal, some early picks. You're in green-white, right? You know you're going to be playing green-white. Uh, you open the pack, rares are dud, you look at the commons, and there's the two drop that has toxic, the 3-1. There's the two drop that has oil on it uh, and that, that you can like tap and activate. And then there's some other random nonsense. You just always take the toxic one because that is the, the, the vector that you most likely picked up most stuff for already. Green white does have most of the toxic vector. You're just never taking the oil one there. So is that a very interesting draft pick? No. <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess I kind of like begs the question of like, at what point do you want your draft to be on rails anyway, from a like EV perspective versus like how, mm -hmm. when do you want the fun in the draft? Do you want it pack two? Do you want it pack one? Do you want it even through pack three? I think that probably changes from player to player. Um, yeah. What happens if that toxic card isn't in the pack? That's the feel bad moment that I think a lot of people sure. are experiencing, right? Because yeah, there is the green two drop and it, you are in green white, but then you go, I guess I take this because it's early and affects the board. And then you wind up with a deck that's horrendously off vector and messing with itself. Yep. And it just feels bad to pilot. And I think a lot of ex people have been experiencing that without really like putting it into the same words that we can with vector theory. Right. Yeah. That's a great point. I think there, there are, there's a lot of overlap on the vectors as we're going to talk about in a minute where they overlap in color. And this is, I think this is a yeah. set that's perfect to talk about vector theory because of this, because there's so many different vectors that are in the exact same color. And mm -hmm. there's overlap between those. And so you can kind of end up in two totally different directions uh, and be playing the same color. Like two green white decks can be in totally different directions. Yeah. Or, or worst case, you wind up with a green white deck that is split between the two. Yep. And then you just get wrecked by one that is more firmly aligned with one. Right. So we've got oil. This is the big one. This is what we got to talk about. Time to get oiled up, get nice and oily because oil, that's where you want to be, I think. Uh, it's not very intricate. It's not very challenging. It's not very, I don't know, not very even thought provoking. You, you just have to do the oil thing, right? Your stuff comes in with oil counters or you tap to add oil counters or remove them to do things. Maybe it's not the deepest draft environment, unlike the draft draft cube, which is awesome. Uh, but if you just take good oil stuff, you take like an oil rare and then a bunch of red and green cards that say oil on them, you're good. <laughs> like yeah. that, that's one of the best things you can do in this format. Yeah. And then everything with proliferate on it just gets better. Uh, again, there is a lot of proliferate in green. I would say probably the oil vector is the one that cares about proliferate more than the toxic one, which might feel yeah, weird. Yeah, I agree. But I, I think I think that's the case. The toxic one is going to kill you with poison without help from proliferate. And the oil, the oil vector really wants to be able to keep those oil counters on creatures long mm -hmm. after they really should be able to keep them on there. Yeah, when you like volt charge your opponent's face or like their best thing and proliferate and you get to put another count on all your stuff, another activation of your scamp, your axiom engraver, what else have you got laying around? That that feels really good. So Cinder slash Ravager is the boogeyman here. This thing is the uh, six mana five five vigilance ETB deal one to all your opponent's stuff. First of all, dealing one to all your opponent's stuff, you can actually do that in this format for four mana. Makes them not able to block two. That's obviously impactful. But just to deal one to everything... That can be a plague wind, right? Against like the white blue decks in particular or the white decks that can reset their board down to nothing. Um, data wise, this thing is one of the highest performing uncommons in the set uh, in both game in hand and overall games played. I mean, it's a huge body, right? It's a five, five vigilance. And sometimes it comes down for three, four, sometimes maybe even two mana, uh, usually three or four. But even at that point, it's, it's very hard to beat this card. It's just the biggest thing, right? Oh yeah, and it's it's really not hard to get it cheaper <laughs> in this deck. Yeah. It's 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 almost never a six drop. So weird gruel cards that look clunky end up being some of the stronger things to do in this format, particularly ramping into them with the cultivator, uh, especially ones that cost four and five because that's where the cultivator really shines. Especially if you can proliferate it too, where you then get to kind of use it like a Llanowar elf, where you don't have to do the in between add a counter then remove type thing. So Furnace Strider, that's where the uh, the one that gives haste, the five mana, four, five. A couple times, I'll admit, I've forgotten to give it haste. As a note about the format, make sure you activate it uh, very, very latest beginning of combat. But you can also do it um, just safely during your main phase. Uh, Koldotha Cackler, the uh, three mana, two, three, that gets plus one, plus oh for each uh, oil, uh, or for each permanent with oil on it. This usually attacks as like a four, three, five, three, sometimes more. Uh, the fact that it has Trample pairs it pretty well, nicely with uh, Pump Spells, Combat Tricks, Cheap Removal, the usual. And the 4-drop, Lattice Blade Mantis. 
This thing looks like a clunker, but it's pretty strong. I mean, it's a four mana, four, three, but it attacks as a five, four vigilance. Just you're attacking for a huge chunk of their life total here. Yeah. And this is another one that's a bit of threat of activation. I mean, you have to activate it when it attacks, but when you're on your own turn and you're thinking, do I get to be aggressive here or not? You have to assume they're going to activate it. And, and that kind of puts you in weird spots a lot of times with attacks. So this deck tends to be pretty aggressive, but it's aggressive in that it's like a ramp deck. I think turn one cultivator is the best start this deck gets because then it starts to get like it's it's four and five drops out of turn early. So it can also stabilize, which is weird for, for a more aggressive deck. Uh, cards like incubation sack go really well here. The oil gorger troll. You can have a, a couple of those at the top end. Uh, a card that's particularly impressed me attracts is skitter fang. This thing just giving something lifelink, one of your big beaters, like a like a four or five lifelink. What's your opponent supposed to do about that? If they were trying to race you with damage, they just can't anymore. And then if you are proliferating or somehow adding more oil counters to it, like with the uh, the, the oily furnace thing, then you're just getting a, a flyer permanently or a lifelinker permanently on attacks, like that type of thing. So a really impressive both early, mid, and late game from this deck. Also, Urbrask's Forge is ridiculous and play it every time you see it. Oh yeah, it's one of the best rares to have in the oil deck. Just not fair. So Corrupted, not great. There's only a handful of cards worth turning Corrupted on for, uh, mostly due to the speed of the format. So like the the six drop ones, uh, there's like the six drop four, four angel. Haven't found this great. Um, You tend to just be incidentally corrupting them on your way to killing them with poison or because you're going wide or attacking with regular damage and you just incidentally do it. I will say Viral Spawning is the one that I want Corrupted for most. The uh, three mana sorcery make a 3-3 three, three with Toxic 1. And then if they're Corrupted, uh, then you can cast it again from your graveyard. But then again, just casting it by itself, you get a 3-3 three, three with Toxic 1. That by itself can turn on Corrupted. You could play this in a card with, uh, in a deck with no other Toxic creatures, and it's still a good card. Yeah, that's true. I think, I think that was something that... I don't know if it was necessarily overlooked, but I personally thought this this vector was going to be a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more punchy as it were. And it's Mm -hmm. just to, to your point, it's just not right. Like there are some reasons to turn corrupted on early incisor gliders. One that I can think of that's like gives you a pretty solid payoff, but you again are never trying to kill with poison in this deck. And you almost always incidentally get there because most white creatures have toxic on them. Quite a few black ones have toxic on it. And so you're just going to get there by attacking, but you're never trying to kill with poison here. And again, some of the, and, and, and also some of the cards that care about that I think are a reason to turn corrupted on for don't really play too well into this card, this, this deck's vector. And for instance, the skitterling, mm, yeah. it's, it's a great card, but like you kind of don't want to be sacking your creatures to draw cards. You really would rather just like kill your opponent, <laughs> yeah. keep your creatures on board, yeah. attack with them and just keep doing the thing. So Especially when your opponent is likely to be beating down or building a huge red-green army of beefers. Uh, I will shout out Vivisection Evangelist. This card is obviously good and a reason to turn on Corrupted. But still, sometimes your board is just like five mites and like a couple two ones. And then they play the Vivisection Evangelist and you go, okay, like you did all that work. You kill my two one with it. I just attack for lethal next turn. Yeah. Uh, I will shout out Anoint with Affliction, which is one of the only black cards at common to be performing like well. <laughs> uh, that one is obviously great if you can get corrupted as well. But past that, nah, I think I'm preferring to just go fully poison kill and like lean really into the white cards. So speaking of poison, that's our last one here. You're basically only going to be in black green or white green if you're if you're going the the direct poison kill vector. White version seems to be a lot better. It, it gets to eat up a lot of those, or, or sorry, uh, not eat up, but take a lot of those same white cards that are making the white-red decks, for instance, very good. Um, a lot of those early toxic creatures just punch really hard. Um, and I get the black-green has the Rot Priest, so like, you know, if you can really build around the Rot Priest, then you're, you're going to be doing pretty great. White-green gets Slaughter Singer, though, and I think that's just better. Yeah, Slaughter Singer is nuts. If you haven't attacked with this, it... it- Functionally gives a little bit of haste too. It kind of works like an overrun if you top deck it in late game and you have a bunch of mites out and all of a sudden they can attack into their three twos and oh, it's 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 pretty gross. I've seen like, yeah, Obzani versions of this, but uh, really if you have Slaughter Singers, you kind of just want to be playing green, white and just start beating down early. Yeah, there's a handful of just like core pieces in white that you're going to be looking for. Things like Crawling Chorus, Duelist of the Deep Faith, 
the crush the the jawbone crusher flensing raptor charge of the mites i mean charge of the mites is just phenomenal you play that in every white deck i think in this format crawling cores is probably the best turn one play in the game in the format as well like yeah it's hard up to there those things um the, the weird thing with this deck is that it like it kind of just kills you period like it doesn't <laughs> care whether it's poison or not like you're just gonna die yeah, yeah, I've actually dealt lethal damage at the same time that I would be dealing poison damage a good number of times, especially when you're making bodies that kind of do both really well. Indoctrination Attendant and Basilica Shepherd are both make big bodies that can deal a sizable amount of damage. I mean, they're three power, right? But they both enter to make mites as well, and they're going wide. Um, I mean, it's limited, right? You, you typically like to have creatures that ETB and make another creature or two. So the Attendant and the Shepherd, I found, have been my preferred... Uh, preferred top end for this deck the proliferate vector is just not really a thing <laughs> proliferate's more of an incidental sort of mechanic that's taped onto a bunch of cards that you'd rather have in your main vector um to support kind of what your vector is doing things like poison or oil or you know i guess sort of corrupted but there really isn't a proliferate deck um it's supposed to be blue black it's just not very good and it is it is yeah. getting crushed if you look at the data blue black is just getting wrecked all around um I guess because it's spells based proliferate stuff. And I don't know, there's some walls in it, right? There's the, there's the four mana two five that can proliferate if you tap it when it enters, which I guess it means you're not blocking <laughs> with it. And yeah, my opponent did do that once. And I was like, Ooh, look at that. I get to attack again. <laughs> right. Proliferate all you want. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of a weird vector. The other thing too, is, you know, you blue black doesn't necessarily care about it as much, but say blue red, for instance, which kind of also wants to be a proliferate deck. It dips into the oil thing a little bit, but it, it kind of feels mm -hmm. like it splits itself. But that one cares about non-creature spells. And so then you're like, okay, I guess I'm playing these art of these equipment that are really trying to make me an aggressive deck, but then my deck's not aggressive because I want to play other non-creature spells. And yeah, it's a, it's one of those where like, you know, we mentioned it earlier. If you're splitting, if your deck is trying to play to two different vector directions at the same time, you end up just playing weaker on both. And then you're, mm -hmm. you're just you'd be better off playing a, a mediocre deck that's pointed in one direction. Um, so yeah. And, and you're not really touching white or red if you're playing proliferate stuff. And that's not really where you want to be in this format. Now there is an artifact vector located in blue and it's kind of built around the eye of Malkator thing, right? This yep. uh, three mana four, four. Well, not always, I guess it's a three mana artifact that ATPs you scry to. And whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, it becomes a four, four uh, until in a turn. This is fine, right? I, I've seen yeah. some some names on, on the internet saying, play four of these things. Just play a yeah. bunch of them, chain them, play a bunch of like skull bombs and that kind of thing. Whatever. I don't care. <laughs> like, congrats. You, you did it. You can attack for four sometimes. If you're telling me that you're going to have like a three mana investment that isn't a creature when I untap and I go to attack with my one, two, and three drop, perfect. You know, like you play at a two drop maybe and then you spent turn three functionally doing nothing. I'm going to race it. I'm going to win if I'm trying to corrupt and, and poison you. Uh, and I'm probably going to have like maybe an artifact removal spell floating around in my deck somewhere. Yeah. I, so that blue deck I talked about earlier, I played three of these. Oh, yeah. And um, they were just kind of all right. You know, like a lot of times you would do that on turn three. You would play one. And you'd scry two, which I guess is cool. It sets up your next draws. Mm -hmm. And then your opponent would untap, play a three drop with haste and just like kill you. Um, <laughs> that doesn't feel good. There are a lot yeah. of situations. I also misread this card. And I think it's because this effect, the artifact or enchantment that sits on the board. And then sometimes you do a thing, it becomes a creature. Mm -hmm. That effect typically happens when you cast something, not when it ETBs. And so oh. I misunderstood mm -hmm. this card for a while thinking, okay, I keep an instant up. I can cast my instant and it's going to turn this thing on at instant speed or whatever for blocks. That's not how it works. You need an artifact to hit the board for it to yeah. be a creature. So it's never blocking for you. And pretty much never. I think there's the cat that has flash the three, two, there but there, that's yeah, pretty it, telegraphed. It, it's telegraphed. And, uh, it's, it's not like a card that you really want to be playing in your decks anyway, the, the yeah, cat. No. Um, so that it's like, you're playing bad cards to make media, like you're playing bad cards to make okay cards better, which just doesn't feel great. Um, I will say the one combo I've liked with the eyes of Malkator is the Unctus dude. I think it's an uncommon ETBs makes an, an artifact of four, four until you, until it leaves the battlefield. Oh, oh yeah. And yeah, so that, that just turns these on, but then you're like curving a, f a three drop into a two drop and that just feels weird. So it's, 
Mm. Or they might both be three drops, but even I think still. three, right? The retrofitter. I did have an opponent, and this is actually in that mono blue deck that I said I got crushed by. Uh, my opponent went, uh, it was the Malkator's Watcher, I believe, the uh, two mana 1 1 Flying Vigilance. Yep. Uh, and then they curved it into the retrofitter, made that a 4 Ooh, 4, and just started smacking me. That was pretty sick. They must have See, had multiples of each. You'd much rather do that than curve an eyes of Malkator into a retrofitter. Yeah, see, that was impressive. Like that, I was actually like, wow, this is a, that's a 4 4 flyer on turn three. <laughs> like, yeah, and, I can't and attack, frankly, I can't block it. Frankly, the value in that whole thing is not the eyes of Malkator, it's the Unctus's retrofitter. So, yeah, we're, yeah. we're talking about, you know, uh, one card making a bad card better. Again, uh, retrofitter you put in any blue deck, that's just a really good blue card. Um, mm-hmm. I think so I like the eyes, the eyes of Malkator, but you really need to build around it. Like, really. Oh, around. yeah. Yeah, and, and I think if you're playing a blue-white deck that's heavy and white and you're making a bunch of mites and doing like yes. the white might beat down thing again anyway, then you're going to have a pretty solid like blue-white deck. Yes, that, I think that's really where this needs to be. Um, that artifact vector is pretty handily seated in, in blue-white. Um, there are mono-blue versions of it, but uh, I don't think... Like a lot of the good artifacts matter payoffs are really in, in the combination of those colors rather than either of them by themselves. So there's a bunch of miscellaneous notes about the format that we wanted to kind of just run through and mention particular cards that we've really liked or two card combos, or uh, at the very end, we're going to leave you with a list of our favorite one drops. So uh, first of all, speaking of I Malkator, I wanted to mention it and its combo with Skrelv's Hive. This is a pretty funny one. Uh, this just turns it on automatically every turn because Skrelv's Hive makes an artifact creature every turn. So at that point, you don't have to put in any other work. Uh, that I think would be the start to a pretty disgusting blue white start. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So free from flesh. This is the one red. It gives plus two plus two and you put two oil counters on it. There's a handful of creatures in this format that say uh, they get plus one plus one for each oil counter on them. So free from flesh is really plus four plus four for those creatures. That includes evolving adaptive. um, That includes uh, the Drake, I think. Trawler Drake. Trawler Drake. uh, And the Necrosquito, I believe. Yep. So Contagious Vorak, the 3-3 three, three, that everyone was losing their minds a bit about, um, first of all, it's just fine. You know, just drawing a land, it's it's whatever. The fact that it goes really well in red-green but doesn't have anything to do with oil, I guess you can proliferate with it, but it doesn't come in with oil, which is really what you want. You want stuff that has oil on it already. It's whatever. It's fine. It's still good. You'll play it. But uh, sometimes I find my red-green decks getting a little full on three drops. Uh, I, I've cut a copy of this before um, just because sometimes you just got too much other good stuff. But anyway, uh, just so you know, you can decline that trigger. The one where it says, like, you put a land into your hand, uh, otherwise proliferate. I've seen opponents, uh, and they've like act- they've had, like, ten lands in the field, empty-handed, and they've had oil counters on other permanents they control, and they have just grabbed a land. I'm like, wait a minute, you didn't have to do that. I'm glad you did, <laughs> but you didn't have to. So uh, everyone out there listening, just know that you can intentionally decline. You don't have to fail to find to proliferate. You can choose to not take a land and then proliferate automatically. Another note here, my favorite two into three combo in the set, Mandible Justiciar and Charge the Mites. Uh, so this thing, it's a 2-1 lifelink, right? You play it on two, and then you attack with it on turn three into pretty much anything in the set. And if you have Charge of the Mites up, well, Charge of the Mites, yeah, it's a deal one. Probably not going to use it for that mode. But if you flash in those two Mites, then your Justiciar all of a sudden becomes a 4-3 lifelink, which can pretty much get through anything that they could possibly have on turn three. Uh, then you've and also got some mites. And it's a great, uh, it's a great breaker for the, the mirror because now you're up for life and yeah. uh, that's an eight point life swing, which is a big deal in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. So Axiom Engraver, a puzzling, puzzlingly good magic card. Uh, the fact that it's just a little one, three, right? It, it, it's, it's unassuming, but as I mentioned before, it can find your rares. It can help you churn through lands, extra top decks in the late game. I would recommend being careful with how you use it. Uh, if you get down to having just one oil counter on it and you know you have ways to proliferate or add oil counters in your deck to things that already have them, I guess, uh, be careful when you lose that last counter. Sometimes you could be tempted to like rummage away like a creature spell in your hand to try to hit like maybe like you want to rummage away a five drop to hit that fifth land. I might wait. You know, and use it to to really filter the late game because top decking extra lands in this format is just so brutal. This is a, a trait of all formats that have no inherent card advantage mechanic. People don't take Hazardous Blast as highly as they should, I think. Yeah, they don't. I'm, I'm happy main decking a copy of this in any red deck. 
at least one. Sometimes I'm happy to, to put in two. I don't think I've ever really wanted to put three, but any deck that can go even remotely wide and, and then you have a card in that deck that says creatures can't block this turn is yeah. a great way to close out games. I, I, you know, I look, I think back to, I think it was Dominary United where um, I loved the white deck that you could play where you would go wide, the board would stabilize. Nobody could attack anywhere because the ground was all gummed up and flyers were kind of getting in each other's way. And then you had the, the really expensive uh, card that did this effect. It pumped your, pumped your creatures and then nothing could block. Hmm. And it was just a great way to close out games. And in this format, even more so because you get in all that aggressive damage early, your opponent may try to stabilize. And then as soon as they do hazardous blast, you lose the game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also found this is good against just a lot of white and blue and green decks anyway. So sometimes they just have a bunch of like, look at the just this year is a, is a two one. There's other random two ones laying around. Uh, and then anything that's might related, it's got one one involved. So this thing I've just cast even on turn four, my opponent had two X ones. I was like, all right, just double removal spell, <laughs> you know? Yep. That being said, I've enjoyed best of three a lot because I get to make these sideboarding decisions. I could bring in an extra copy against a white deck or side it out against like a red green deck where it's not as effective. Uh, like something like black green, huge toughness. You're never really going to use this to kill their stuff unless you're like going to use it to build Y, but then you might want something like artifact or enchant removal instead. Uh, another note about this card, good for assassinating planeswalkers. I specifically boarded in a copy of this against an opponent that had uh, Jace because they were like a super defensive blue green deck and uh, had the ability to like scry a bunch and reliably find their Jace. So I knew it was going to get into a board stall. I brought in an extra copy of this and uh, I did have it where on turn four, they slammed the Jace, upticked on a creature. Uh, my turn, I cast the blast uh, and managed to attack and kill the Jace and went on to win the game. There you go. That's a good way to do it. Now, my favorite one drop in the format so far, it's Saw Blade Scamp. I love this little guy. Uh, and it's a great combo with equipment. It's the one that says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets an oil counter. If you curve this into the Batter Fist, for example, Batter Fist is a functionally 3-1 creature, but it's technically an equipment. So it does put a counter on the Sawblade Scamp. I had a really, really tight game. I posted a screenshot on Twitter where the literal only way I had to win was top decking in a, uh, some sort of non-creature spell. Uh, with my Sawblade Scamp on the field, I had jumped with everything else. My only creature left was the Scamp. My opponent was at one, and I knocked the top of my deck, digitally, metaphorically, and ripped the Hover Wings. And now, if that had just been a 4-mana 3-2 flyer, I would have lost the game. But because it was an equipment and triggered the Scamp, I cast it, tapped it, pinged them to dead. There you go. Speaking of goofy things, uh, <laughs> uh, I had a Phyrexian Vindicator resolving it for the second time in the format in a very mono white splashing red deck uh i happen to have a bunch of the rebel salvos that's the three mana deal five at some point my opponent went to remove my vindicator with an x-file effect uh i dealt five to my own vindicator to deal five to their face because the next turn i knew i could just swing for lethal if they were five points lower life total <laughs> a small interaction it didn't kill it uh, would have been nice if it could. I guess then you could do stuff with the graveyard with it. Uh, it prevents the damage no matter what source it comes from, you or the opponent. But it was pretty sick. Yeah, that's uh, them's the combos, I guess. But that said, we've got like a massive amount of really good one drops in this format. We mentioned oh, yeah. Crawling Chorus being one of them, but there are also a lot in not even just red and green. Like Bilius Squ Skull Dweller is another really good one. Uh, I guess you're not really thrilled to be playing black, but if you're going to play black, you want one of these. Mm -hmm. There's the exuberant fuseling. That's the uncommon that uh, it can functionally be a one mana seven one, all right, with trample too. Uh, and if you can give this one also oil counters, this one also pairs well with the free from flesh. Uh, just a really disgusting attacker. Again, only one mana. Cacophony scamp. Uh, not is uh, it's up there with saw blade scamp. It, it's a great early game blocker, right? It blocks really get well against X ones. It can take out two mites. And that can be valuable sometimes. Um, and sometimes you just attack with it, right? And you can equip it. And uh, I had an opponent make it into a 4-1. And then when it died, it dealt four to my face. And I was like, all right, that's, uh, I guess I'm dead. So uh, that one is is pretty solid. You definitely want it in your red decks. Pretty much never cut it. I mentioned the adaptive. Uh, there's also Rust Vine Cultivator, the, the green one that's not quite Llanowar Elves. Uh, Sawblade Scamp, obviously. Swooping Lookout, pretty nice in the red-white decks. That's the one white for 1-2 Flying Vigilance. Uh, if you can put some equipment on this, it gets pretty stupid pretty fast. I mean, yeah, that's it. That's that's the format as we see it right now. Or like I said, we're about, I don't know, a week and a half into it or so. And um, 
I think there's a lot more going on here than I was originally giving it credit for. I think originally I had said I was a little worried that every deck was just going to feel like the same thing because the there aren't really too there's not too much diversity in mechanics in this format. It doesn't feel that way. I don't think every deck feels the same. In fact, I think they all play out quite differently. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm a little disappointed that it's so lopsided into Naya. It would have been nicer to see it a little more even across the board. But I'm I'm glad that Red Green is kind of getting some spotlight and the uh, equipment's actually doing the thing for once. Um, so that's all great. Overall, I'm excited to to keep giving this some some drafts. I'm not really ready to call it quits just yet. Um, so looking forward to drafting more of it. Yeah, same. Think of it this way. The blue-black players, they got to experience this in Midnight Hunt, right? They had their organ hoarders and and their, their murderous opportunists and all that nonsense. It's my turn now. <laughs> it's time for the Naya beatdown players to, to live a little. Well, if you'd like to... Uh, chat with us outside of the show or outside of social media or anything jump in the discord is the best place to be to talk with us again if you want highlights from the uh, mtg philly or you just want to show off all your trophies and see if you can reach the top of our leaderboard again jump in the discord link to that's in the episode description as well as on our twitter page and if you'd like to support the show directly you can do so on patreon patreon.com forward slash draft pod and you can find us on social media on twitter at draft pod thanks folks and we'll catch you next week so all of our non-American listeners, you might just want to go now. We're going to talk about American football. I don't know if you care about this. <laughs> you say that, but so ma- there were like highlights of so many different countries watching the Super Bowl. Oh, really? Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. Oh. Huh. Must have missed that part. Uh, I, I don't want to assume that everyone in the world would care about American football, <laughs> so I thought I'd warn people. But uh, did you watch the Super Bowl? I did. I'm an American who doesn't care about American football, but <laughs> hey, it's an opportunity for people to throw a party and have some good food and stuff, so I just went and hung out. Yep. Yep. Same here. Had a million wings. It was awesome. Uh, man, those last two minutes. So this it was, was a crazy. This was an awesome game. This was like a good back and forth game. For the record, it was it was tied 35 35 with around three minutes left in the game. That's that's a good game, right? That's yeah. that's like back and forth. Um, a lot of errors on the side of the Eagles. I believe there were two fumbles that led to touchdowns. A yeah. uh, little disappointing. Close to it, yeah. Yeah, a little, little embarrassing on that, that their offense was, I mean, mo- mostly there, but um, just a little glass cannon, I guess. So anyway, it came down in the last two minutes uh, to a weird holding call. And then um, the Chiefs, they had like really good field position and uh, they knew that if they ran out the clock, they could get it so that the Eagles would only have like seconds to attempt uh, any kind of plays. They knew that they could run down the clock, make an easy field goal attempt and then just like kind of coast and win by basically wasting as much of the Eagles time left as possible. And it got me thinking, what's the magic equivalent of this, of of this kind of like rules lawyering? I mean, we saw it to the point where the chiefs intentionally did not score a touchdown because it would run the clock out more. Um, They, they, you know, were managing their timeouts. They like, they delayed scoring a touchdown, right? I think they did end up scoring it, but they they waited until the last possible second. And for anybody who's still listening, who doesn't know American football, there is this stupid rule. And I, this frustrates me to no end. I absolutely hate that this is a thing. Uh, But there's a rule where you can quote unquote, take a knee. And essentially Mm -hmm. what you do is you, the quarterback just literally knees down on, like puts a knee down on the field and that stops the play, but it doesn't stop the clock. Yeah. So the clock keeps ticking down while they're maintaining possession of the ball. So the opposing team doesn't have a, a chance to gain possession. And basically they did this while they were within like two or three yards of the touchdown zone. Yeah. And we're just running the clock out. And then they eventually scored a touchdown. The Eagles had, I think four or five seconds to make a play from the other side of the field to now basically go a hundred yards and make a touchdown, um, which is virtually impossible. You have to get pretty lucky. I would say to make that even worse. You need a kickoff return, you know? Yeah. Well, and then that was another thing that the Eagles screwed up. Like they, they had the one, um, yeah, the one like kickoff and, uh, I can't remember who on the chiefs was, was running it, but you know, he got the ball and he ran almost the length of the whole field. It was a record breaking kickoff return Yeah, in the super bowl and like nobody could stop the guy. So <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, that was a little bit of a problem too. Yeah. I mean, obviously like we, we can say that there should have been better, tighter plays at all different points along like, Oh, if they had blocked any one of those touchdowns or if they had prevented any one of them, uh, then we wouldn't have gotten to the point where it was so close in the final few minutes. But that being said, it was a really interesting back and forth and like cool to watch until that last two minutes the holding where, call, yeah. 
Yeah. So functionally, what happened was they they used their timeouts. They would like uh, they would allow the play clock, which is like ticking and requires the play to start within a certain amount of time. They would allow that to almost run out timeout uh, to then reset the play clock and then another timeout. And it's I was thinking about this. It's almost the equivalent of and I have a few ideas and I'd like the listener to tell me which of them these they think might be the closest. Uh, it's similar to Trump blocking while your opponent is they have like two cards left in their library. Right. And and you know that mm. eventually they're going to just going to draw out and just lose. And you need to totally change the way that you play the game. Like maybe you're like a burn deck, but all of a sudden you start using your creatures to block instead of attack. I don't know how the situation would happen. That's not important. But um, you are all of a sudden angling for an entirely different win con and you're thinking all right how do i now win the game based on the fact that there's two cards left in their library and so you start like chump blocking their, their biggest creatures instead and you know that if you chump block properly you'll just win because of decking out is that a close equivalent because i have other options too i i think that's a pretty close equivalent i think that's a tough situation to find yourself in but it can happen um the interesting thing with like f- with a clock perspective right is that like magic kind of gets around that by having extra turns so you can't just mm-hmm. run, in person, you can't just run out the clock. You can do that on arena or MTG. Well, not on arena on MTGO. You can do that, I guess. So here's my, my next option. Uh, is it like that? Or is it more similar to uh, on MTGO intentionally blocking, uh, which takes more time for your opponent to then assign blockers to right. attempt to run out there, say under a minute clock. When um, you know that the blockers don't really matter, that it's not actually having an effect on like life totals or anything like that, um, in an attempt to wear their their clock down. Yeah, I think it's probably closer to the latter. Um, the weird thing is with football, that's like an inherent rule of the game that you're like that's a thing you can do. Um, I guess you can totally change your strategy in a in a game of Magic. I don't know that there's necessarily a, necessarily a rules loophole that lets you essentially force your opponent to lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe maybe decking is actually a better a better situation of that because kind of seems that like is, it, right? that is kind of a rules loophole in that you have to draw a card every turn and if your opponent is close enough to the end of the deck that you're just like okay I'm not even going to worry about winning I'm just going to f- force them to lose now here's my third option and this might be the messiest one uh, you're in person at a paper tournament you've gone to turns and you are making plays such that you will not lose but you also will not win yeah, so that is that is an interesting spot. I've seen people do this in person, actually. Um, mm-hmm. And remind me, because it's been so long since I've ever actually played a game that goes to turns. How do they determine the winner in, in, when it goes to turns? Is it by life total? <laughs> I went to a game store once that did determine the, like by life total without going to extra turns. Like if the clock oh, uh, ended, they would just look at whoever had the higher life total. I, I didn't like that store very much. but um, And honestly, that affected my drafting sometimes. I was like, all right, 3-3 uh, th- three, three lifelink. Yep, get it get it in here. Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, but um, a- anywho, yeah, no. Uh, once it ends, um, it's, a, it's a draw. It's just a yeah, draw. Yeah, it just goes to draw. Okay. And draws so, tend to not look very good on, uh, on paper, on stats for wins. Like it tends to be someone, it's, it's best overall for someone to have won and someone to have lost because then you have a higher, well, if you win, uh, then you also care about your opponents, like game win rate. And, and it, right. it gets into the, the nitty numbers that I don't like very much, but, uh, you'd rather have someone win, right? Yeah, typically. Um, and, and if you don't know the way that the, uh, point system works in, in a magic tournaments, typically uh, a win is three points, a draw is one and a loss is zero. So if you draw both players have one point added to their respective point totals, and then that just like weirdly kind of messes up the math for the rest of people trying to do tiebreakers or whatever, because now you're going up against somebody who's had a draw instead of a win, which kind of is weird in Swiss. Like uh, they have a yeah, lower game win called. rate. So then beating them does less for your opponent game right. win rate than if you'd been paired differently. It's, it's a mess. Yeah. I mean, it, realistically, if you can just win, like it doesn't matter. But um, when it comes out of tiebreakers, draws make things really weird. So here's what's going to happen this weekend. We're going to get paired match one out of like a thousand people. And we're just going to intentionally gonna, draw, right? It's going to happen, <laughs> isn't it? What we should do, honestly, if we're going to, if we're going to think of, I don't know, should we like game a, a strategy for that? Do we just like f- play through the games, but then force one of us to drop essentially? Uh, well, starting and then crushing the losers it bracket isn't like, the worst way to do it. You, you could seven one and make it the top eight, right? Well, I mean, like if if we were and we won't, but if we were going to a, to if it looked like we were going to draw the match, would one of us just be like, "Yeah, take the win"? Oh, totally. Yeah. Is that even a, is that even allowed in in comp Are you allowed to do oh, that? You could always scoop, right? <laughs> oh, fair enough. Fair enough.